they ended up giving me a sales position and I also do parts and warranty coordination. And then I do kind of stuff like this, where I go, like I mentioned with careers next generation, I do some work with promoting females in the trades or just even young people in the trades, why wits, so young women in technology and trades. Um, and I've done a few seminars with uh, junior achievement. So really cool, wonderful opportunities to be able to talk to some of the younger girls in high school and Hey, fellow workers, this is Kim Seaver, and you're turning in to the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are a proud member of the Labor Radio Network, also new as of this season, a member of the Harbinger Media Network. We're broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsitsapi, and this is episode six of season two. Today's guest is Courtney Stinson, journeyman refrigerator mechanic. Welcome, Courtney. Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. You betcha. I'm really excited to have you because I believe that you are the first woman tradesperson that I've had on the show. So I'm really excited about that. Well, that's super excited. I wish that there was going to be more soon. So hopefully you got a lot more coming down the line. <laughs> hopefully. Maybe this podcast will inspire some people. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So what we'll just do is we'll just go straight into it. We'll just have you tell your life story, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, you know, stuff like that. Any cool stuff you've done. And then we'll have you tell us your personal labor history, your first job, subsequent jobs, the journey you took to get to where you are today. And you can either tell that at the end, or you can just fill it in as you do your life story. But it's up to you. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. So as you said, I, my name is Courtney Stinson, and I am a journey person, refrigeration mechanic and air conditioning mechanic. So I was born here in Lethbridge back in 1990. Woo, I'm getting old, but uh, <laughs> born here in Lethbridge. And then when I was about four or five years old, my parents moved us out to a acreage about 20 minutes east of Lethbridge here. So grew up out on an acreage and we were kind of the first around that area. So there really wasn't much around except for farmer's fields and cow patties and all that fun stuff. So I got a lot of time outside and we didn't have internet too much. It was all, you know, dial up really slow, three channels, uh, just the generic growing up on acreage, right? When we were younger, I guess. So from there, I kind of spent a lot of time outside. I played outside as much as I could. Yeah, I was always the one outside. My sister was always the one inside. Uh, family of four growing up out there. I have a little sister and she's a traveler. She She's kind of a free spirit. She goes and does her own thing. And she's heading to Thailand this year. So she leaves tomorrow and has no ending date to come back. So she's just going to kind of go and follow her heart and her and her boyfriend. So. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. It'll be exciting for her. So I'm, I'm super excited to hear her stories. So. <laughs> so yeah, we lived out there and uh, my parents still live out there. So Grew up out there, went to school here in Lethbridge, started at Gilbert Patterson in kindergarten, uh, all the way up until grade eight, back when they had elementary school. And then I went over to LCI and uh, I played a lot of sports. And that was my big thing is I was a huge jock and anything I could play, I would play. Yeah, it was beautiful time growing up and playing sports. I mean, I think a lot of it had to do with being on the acreage and the first kids that moved anywhere near us were boys. And, you know, so it was oh. always a competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think, you know, that kind of started me off and I don't know, I guess a more male dominated area. I was always trying to kick the boys butts in any kind of sports I can get into. <laughs> sure. I didn't realize that Gilbert Patterson used to have elementary school grades. A lot of people didn't know that, but yeah, back in 94, 95, I started in elementary there and okay. we were kind of the last ones that went through Gilbert Patterson Elementary and after my sister they started slowly taking the grades away as people went along so kindergarten would leave and the next year grade one would go and then grade two and they phased it out eventually but it was kind of a cool thing to say that I went to elementary school at Gilbert Patterson because people are like what are you talking about that's junior high so yeah kind of really cool to be in the same school for that long too and having the same teachers and so that was really exciting <laughs> you didn't go somewhere else for middle school then no, no, I stayed at Gilbert Patterson. So it was oh, okay. just a transition into the other side of the school kind of and just yeah. new teachers and but teachers you knew already because you're already in that school. So I think that was, you know, easy transition from going to elementary and junior high that way. But yeah, it was K to nine back then. So Oh, it went to nine as well. Mm hmm. Oh, wow. And that was before middle school started at or grade six to eight or whatever. So I was one of the first to go to high school in grade nine. So that was, oh, I was, okay. I think the second year that I was a baby in a big world. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. 
but yeah, no. And then I transferred over to LCI and still the same thing. I played every sport I could play, basketball, volleyball, softball, cross country, track and field. Wasn't allowed to play rugby because I had too many head injuries from previous sporting incidences. So <laughs> was that a school thing or your parents? My doctor, actually, he said I would recommend not playing rugby because I had oh, asked okay. because I just got off of a, a volleyball head injury. And yeah, he just said no, unless you were really willing to wear a helmet and take it easy. And I wasn't that kind of person. I was a one to a hundred and nothing in between. So <laughs> you didn't want to be the only one out of both teams wearing a helmet. Like, exactly. So yeah, I played softball instead. <laughs> With a helmet. So, yeah, no, well. No, not back then. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> they didn't have those safety implements back then, but it was always fun watching all the rugby girls doing all their training around and they'd be running while we were standing there catching a ball and eating spits. So it was kind of <laughs> fun that way. But uh, no, I played a lot of sports and I was involved in some of my choirs and I was like to sing and into the music scene a little bit. Um, not as much as my sister, but no, I uh, dabbled a little bit in there but sports kind of took over but we actually got to go to Japan with a basketball tournament or a basketball trip so we spent two weeks there and got to actually live with host families and we hosted wow. a young girl too and so that was a crazy experience being able to do that with basketball and no doubt yeah no it was a it was a great time and I loved playing sports and to this day I would still get back into a lot of it if I could but injuries have prevailed so <laughs> But yeah, other than that, I played a lot of sports. So we did a lot of family camping trip. I played a lot of uh, city sports as well. So I played on the Lethbridge Selects. They're not around anymore, but Lethbridge Selects was a basketball team. And the Lethbridge Shooters was a basketball team. And then I played, I think, five or six years with LVC, which is Lethbridge Volleyball Club. We played a lot of sports. It was a, a lot of work on my parents because it was, uh, I would after school be into a practice. And then right after that, there was another practice and getting home eight or nine o'clock at night sometimes. And yeah. It was a busy time. So I've always been a very, very busy person. <laughs> You'd have multiple practices the same day? Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was actually times where I would be playing in two different sports teams and we'd have two different tournaments in a weekend. And I would be like Friday, Saturday in Calgary and then drive up for Sunday, Monday in Edmonton. And oh my goodness. We put on a lot of kilometers. So <laughs> played nationals volleyball in Ottawa and that was ooh, 2007, I think. So we did a lot of traveling for sports. <laughs> Your parents must have been very supportive. Oh, they were. They were fantastic. And they've been together for oh, like 35 years now still going strong and they super supportive parents they've been fantastic throughout this whole thing so that's cool yeah it was a, a busy busy time for me so I think that mentality of going from like a sports team and the team aspect and everything has really like kind of played into where I am as an adult now is my morals and my standards and all that kind of stuff my commitment sports are a really huge thing in my life that I find that kind of brought me to where I am so <laughs> yeah totally graduated in 2008 and um after that, I really had no idea where I was going with my life. And I was that typical teenage girl that didn't know where I was going to go and how I was going to get there and what I wanted to do with my life. My first job was when I was 16, I believe. I was just cleaning my dad's uh, business because I couldn't keep a job with all my sporting events and stuff. So it was just too much time. So it was kind of a, an agreement with my parents that they would still pay for most of all my stuff as long as I was busy and active and, you know, not skipping practices and stuff. <laughs> So no, after high, like I said, after high school, I was really, what was your dad's business? I, it's just a local business here in Lethbridge. It was Hagen Electric, but he since then has sold and oh, okay. doesn't work any there anymore. Well, he works there still, but he's not part owner anymore. So right. he's moved okay. on. So that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, we did that and I cleaned his shop and just basic janitorial stuff two times a week. And then once I graduated, I uh, got a job. What was my first? It was probably a. Uh, Superstore, I guess. Superstore. I was in the deli and I worked there for a little while and in the retail scene there. And then I was working at Costco Gold's Gym and I got a part time job at Totem Building Supplies. Oh, nice. Lots of popcorn. Oh, too much popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I think the smell's still embedded in some of my clothes, but. <laughs> So yeah, and then I ended up getting a full-time job at Totem. So I just started going full-time there. And that's kind of where I got into more of the home renovations and building and just all that kind of stuff. And I had no idea what any of that was before. Like screwdrivers, I was not a mechanical person at all. It was just started at Totem and I was a cashier and it was, you know, learning some of the basic stuff. And it was amazing how much 
information you picked up just from talking to people and asking them about their projects and, you know, what's that and what does it do? And, you know, things really started to pick up. That's cool. Yeah, it was really cool. And it, you know, I think that again, I always tell people that was my stepping stone into where I am now, because then I got transferred into the paint department and started mixing paint and helping people do colors and, you know, what type of stains and paints would be good for their job and the chemistries of all the paint. And so really got into that as much as I I actually ended up getting a job at Dulux Paints here in Lethbridge. So I worked there for a couple of years and got into that a little bit. And I got really into the paint thing, but retail just wasn't for me. And I just, you know, still was searching for that thing out there that I knew was going to happen eventually. And, and it did. This is one of the biggest parts of, I think, a huge part and a huge opportunity for my part is that we ran into a friend of the family and I went to school with their kids and they owned a local HVAC company here, ABC Heating and Cooling. Yeah. And they actually asked my parents, like, what's Courtney doing these days? And they said, oh, you know, she's trying to figure her life out. Typical, you know, 20 year old girl and (laughs) trying to figure it out. (laughs) Taking a gap year. Yeah, maybe four, but. (laughs) So, yeah, no, they just said, hey, well, if she's ever interested in seeing what this is all about, then come and see it. I had no idea what refrigeration was. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I went and shadowed somebody for a day and they you know, said, hey, would you like to come on board and do this then? And I said, you know, it doesn't seem too crazy. Sure, let's do it. So it was kind of a no idea what I was getting into and then following a guy around for a day and I get to be outside and I get to talk to people and it's not in an office setting. I drive around all day. I see all sorts of type of people that that's really cool. So it was a challenge learning it all. Cause again, I was, as they call it, greener than green. And I right. didn't know anything about any of it at all. So, so I got into it and I did my first three years with them doing commercial and residential HVAC stuff. So I was a technician. So I fixed air conditioners and furnaces and ventilation systems and I was on call 24 hours a day and midnight call outs and all that fun stuff and then uh, right after my third year of school it was a very small company so I really wanted to find somewhere that I could learn more off of more people who have been maybe in the trade longer or had different tips and tricks and had a bigger customer base so I applied at KB and got a got a job there and been with them for about five years now and in the trade about 10 years now. So no, it's uh, been an adventure and it was definitely a huge learning curve. And I actually had one of my instructors in school say, you know, people don't just wake up and decide to be a refrigeration mechanic. You you know, you were always tinkering with cars and I was kind of sitting there like, oh, that was me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh it was fun so and did you go to the college no i they don't offer it here in Lethbridge, okay. so i had to go up to state oh i see so in calgary four-year program two months at a time usually just stayed with some friends or friends of family or wherever i can get because it was only two months so it wasn't too terribly away from home and yeah school was awesome like i was the only girl in the class and really oh yeah no, I'm actually one of two girls south of Calgary who hold this ticket. So, oh my goodness, wow. Yeah. Pioneer. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, it's not a very popular trade, which is crazy because it's a, a good money making trade if you can get into the commercial. Because I'm, you know, qualified to work in ice rinks and oh, yeah, oh, wow. so that's actually okay. a, one of big things about my trade is you could go work on, you know, industrial sized equipment and nice. yeah. So we won't touch like a refrigerator in your house, but I will go and walk in to a big one that's in a butchery or a restaurant and I can work on those. So yeah. Did you do NMAX? Well, our company did NMAX before I started, but uh, I don't really do any of the industrial stuff. Like we only have a few companies locally that will touch the industrial stuff. So, and honestly, the dangers of it somewhat is it got a little like you know, the ammonia and stuff like that it's uh, a little bit nerve-wracking and then it was a, the lifestyle is a little different too just being you have to be there you have to go if it's broken down it's oh, you might be okay. driving you know a couple hours just to go and where you know residential stuff you know you, you're really busy you can usually wait a little bit there's a lot of big differences between the stuff so with the HVAC stuff too I find there's a lot more variables and it's more of a puzzle but yeah no it was a wonderful experience in state I've made a lot of like lifelong friends up there I think I was maybe one of 10 girls in the whole entire building when we were there was it all, like all the trades were in the building or just particular trades particular trades we were in the brand new building on 16th so they do host like the welding and the mechanics and all that stuff were in there again with all the different schedules too like a lot of the time we weren't in the same time as some of the other trades so but yeah there was definitely a lot of trades in that building so it was a lot of a lot of people (laughs) 
Yeah. And only 10 of you were women. Yeah, about, I would say, I would say oh, wow. about around that. So there was a couple instructors that were female and then there was a couple welders and a couple plumbers, but yeah, it was definitely all four years. I think I seen one other girl in my program two years before oh, me. Okay. So I was in fourth year and they were in second. Not a huge popularity for women, but I hope to change that one day because it is something that I believe a lot of girls could get into. So, <laughs> but no, uh, as a school, like school was fantastic. I had a great group of guys. I went school mostly with the same guys every year and yeah they were super accepting of me being a female I mean funny actually one of the instructors my first year had told the boys because I wasn't in class yet and they had you know said to the boys you know we do have a girl in the class this year just so you know <laughs> we'll just uh you know just make sure we're all being appropriate and <laughs> they got the talk <laughs> So no, it was, it was fantastic. They were super accommodating. I never felt out of place. I never felt looked down upon because I was a female and your classmates are always respectful and everything. Very. Yeah. No, they were always very good. Yeah. Honestly, I really haven't had any really big problems with that. It's been a great experience for me and school was fun. I mean, it was school. So it was a lot of information, a little, little, little bit of time. So it was different. And I'd been out of school for oh, four or five years already from high school. So it was a lot of bring back some of the math skills and stuff like that. Yeah. That was a little difficult, but uh, we got through it and I made it. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a uh, beautiful and having a four-year course and only two months at a time and getting the chance to get hands-on and stuff I think when the apprenticeship program is fantastic so I guess I encourage anybody to look to reach out to anybody if they're looking for information it's a great program and I think you know the government's giving a lot of grants still and it's I guess it's unpopular now so (laughs) I guess and that's the nice thing is like if there's a big demand and not all the people going in then once you graduate you can go around and pick whatever job you want basically yeah and be able to maybe negotiate a pretty decent wage so there's some positives to that too oh exactly so i mean definitely positives and like i think with uh a lot of the older generation you know getting older and retiring and stuff you know we noticed a lot through covid where a lot of the older generation just said you know we're done then we don't need to be working still so i mean we're packing it in and the next generation can kind of come up and take. And I think we're seeing a really big gap there where it's, we're looking for employees, but there's not many coming up anymore. There's not ready. Anyone looking for jobs. They're all pretty happy where they're at. Yeah. I've heard it kind of around the industry a lot lately. So interesting. Yeah. But. All right. So the, so now you're at where you are now. The Alberta worker podcast is a proud member of the labor radio podcast network. Here's a jingle from another member of the network. Hey folks, it's Bama Athreya, your host on The Geek Podcast. You can find us on Stitcher, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And this show is now part of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. You can discover more than just us by visiting their website at laborradionetwork.org. The Labor Radio Network will help you find your favorite union podcast or radio show. Besides this one, of course. And now back to the show. You're listening to the Alberta Worker Podcast. Yeah, so I uh, I was working as a service technician for about four or five years with KB Heating, and then I ended up having some nerve and spinal issues. So unfortunately, oh. I took a couple of, well, a year or two off for disability, and okay, I still worked at KB almost every day, um, just doing odds and ends and stuff. And then they ended up giving me a sales position. And I also do parts and warranty coordination. And then I do kind of stuff like this, where I go, like I mentioned, with careers next generation, I do some work with promoting females in the trades, or just even young people in the trades, uh, YWIT, so young women in technology and trades. (laughs) I always get that one mixed up. But um, and I've done a few seminars with uh, junior achievement. So really cool, wonderful opportunities to be able to talk to some of the younger girls in high school. And we actually just uh, put on a spring break camp in our in a, a KB and we had about a 10 girls come in and just get some hands on some soldering and they got to do a few little things like that. So they had a lot of fun and we hired one of them. So they're working out in our commercial department right now. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's really fun. And I, I really actually a lot of it, I really enjoy doing these little things where, you know, bringing awareness to a trade doesn't have to be a dirty stinky yucky job like with mine it was a lot of the time I came home clean and it was you know I used a lot of my brain instead of my you know my body to do stuff so I mean I guess in that 
case, you really got to pick your trade and, you know, find what you want to do. And there's, you know, plumbers that won't touch the dirty stuff. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Like, I know a lot of guys who'll just work on clean water. They don't touch the, the dirty stuff. Okay. There's a lot of misconceptions with the trades I find. So it's one of those things, like if you can really give it a chance, like so a lot of people find it just fun and keeps you busy and it keeps your mind occupied all the time. So for me, that's one of the biggest parts. It's always a challenge and it's always a new puzzle to figure out. So, right. Yeah, absolutely. We had some renovations done to our basement about 15 years ago and we had a pretty new electrician come and do work. And we live in a house that's like, well, at the time it was almost a hundred years old and we had a knob and tube wiring and stuff. And he needed to call some of his buddies to come give him a hand because he had some of the stuff he saw down there, he had never seen before. And so it's like good learning experience for him, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No, I hear you. It's a hundred year old house. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, it's always exciting to open up the walls and see what's behind there. Cause you don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, no, other than that, uh, I think one of my favorite things about being in the trade and doing what I do is it made me an independent person. Like it made me not afraid to live on my own. I lived on my own for, you know, 10 years here in Lethbridge and I have a boyfriend who lives with me now. And so those few years where I was alone, you know, I mean, I had my hundred year old house pipes burst and had three floors of water, but I was knowledgeable enough to know how to turn it off and fix the problem. And I think I had the water back on within 10 minutes and Oh, wow. Yeah, my furnace has gone out and I was able to do that myself. I can do mostly all the electrical in my house. It's made me an independent person. And, you know, as a female who didn't have anyone else around for a long time, and my parents are out of town and I spend a lot of time, you know, by myself and trying to figure out life. And it just has made me confident on my own so I can do almost any home renovation myself. And if not, then I've made contacts and made people in the industry that, you know, I'll scratch your back, you're scratch mine. I'll, you know, fix this if you come do that. And so it's kind of really kind of cool that you have all this knowledge you can put together and you can actually, and even like, I'm a huge cooker. I love to cook. I love to bake. And just having like knowledge and heat transfer from my trade and how, how energy transfers and it, it, it's even up that game. Like I'm all, even like getting better at cooking because I know how, well, if I did this and this and this, it'll cook this faster. You know, it's yeah kind of cool. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, and the idea of like being able to have skills to be able to fix stuff around your house and stuff. I, I mean, I've never been a tradesperson, but I did take shop in uh, high school. Mm -hmm. When the guy we hired to do the electrical work on our renovations downstairs, he roughed in everything. And then I went in and wired up all the receptacles and because I had taken electrical class. And so I, it's amazing how long it had been. It, it had been almost 20 years since I graduated, but I still was able to remember where all the wires go and stuff. So, you know, it can come in handy. You never know when skills like that could come in handy yeah and especially in like this day and age of you know youtube and being able to find most information online now i mean it's still nice to understand what they're telling you and you're not like well what does that term mean or like what do you mean you did this and so it's like you know i can watch a video and be like oh okay you know i get what he's doing there and I know, like, even when my boyfriend's out working on his car right now, like, I can understand what he's doing and I understand where his problems could be and little tips and tricks he might need, or it's definitely worth it. <laughs> totally. All right. So I think that probably brings us to the end of your life story because we're kind yeah. of in the present day now. So one question that I are always ask my guests, and I think you might have already touched on it, but we'll see where it goes. How has your intersections of marginalization ever affected your life as a worker? And so that could be anything from gender to ethnicity to uh, religion, sexual orientation, economic class, age disability, whatever. There's some incidents, like a lot of, I mean, the joke is, is a lot of time when I would have to call a customer and say, you know, I'm on your, my way to come fix your stuff. And I was always taken as an office administrator or secretary or, um, and when you showed up at someone's house, it was like, oh, you're here to fix it. It's like, yeah, I'm here. And like, I find, you know, I think it's with any career. Like if you go and you're going to work, and you're there to work and you know your stuff, you really don't get much pushback. I mean, you see the looks, you feel it a little bit once here and there with mostly customers. Okay. I really haven't had a problem. I think it's starting to be a lot more accepted this, this day and age in the industry. Now, I think it's starting, you're seeing a lot more females come along and it's really starting to get, yeah, normalized in this industry. So I guess like the workers, I really, again, I really haven't had a problem. They've been super accepting, super friendly. 
Nice. Couldn't say enough about the guys I've worked with and went to school with. And yeah, some of the customers are always, you know, like, you know, I've, I've been asked, you know what you're doing and yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> I can show you if you'd like, you want to come watch, like you can go ahead. Like, you know, there's some things there, but uh, as I got going more and more, especially with KB, you tend to see the same customer base and they get used to seeing you and they know what you're doing. And it, it's not a huge thing, but there has been times where, yeah. Sure. Oh, tell the guys to come in the back. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll come in the back. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> and then they show up. They're like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, other than that, it's, you know, it's been, I mean, easy. And I mean, I, I haven't personally had problems. I mean, of course I've talked to other girls and they, a few of them have had instances, but right. you can usually find and steer your way around that. And if you find yourself in a position where you're feeling uncomfortable, I mean, there's so many job opportunities out there, you will find someone and something to be accepted. So yeah, it's really not as bad as it used to be, I'm sure. Of course. <laughs> the nice thing is that with you showing up to all these people, it's changing a lot of people's perceptions, right? Because they probably have exactly. only had men show up before. And now they're having women show up. It's like, oh, yeah, I guess I got to rethink how I see this or whatever. Well, and it also, like, I found a lot of, like, I mean, I'm going to people's houses during the day. And, I mean, typically still is about, you know, 80% when you're going to someone's house during the day. It's the, the woman of the home or someone right. who's home, right? And I've had a lot of comments where it was like, well, I'm really glad you're a girl. I feel a lot more comfortable this way. And oh. I've been asked for before. I've had customers call in and say, hey, can we have that girl come out again? And <laughs> nice. I never remember her name. It's always that girl. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of cool to be, you know, accepted like that too. And, you know, be there and being able to talk to even new homeowners and young people who just bought their first home and, you know, being able to go and, you know, tell them, Hey, this is how this works. This is how this works. And it's just always rewarding to see them click and, you know, understand it and feel more comfortable in their house. So I guess I'm a little more approachable in that sense with being a female, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, it's, you know, the typical old grumpy trades person that people <laughs> kind of put that standard in, but it's, you know, it's changing. So <laughs> yeah. Totally. All right. Well, any final thoughts for our listeners? No, I like, I think I kind of touched base before is, you know, uh, if you're interested in a career in the trades, I always say, give it a try. If you don't like it, you can make some money, learn something useful. Even if you get through all four years of your training and get your journey person to certificate, you can always go on and do something else and you're making money while you're doing something else or achieving a goal. If you want to become a nurse later on, let's just use a nurse or anything, really a police officer, anything, you know, you have that background that you can fall back on. If it's, you know, something doesn't pan out or you're in the middle of a job, you can always go back. And like I said, to just be an independent person and being able to, you know, do things on my own and feel confident that way. And I do really Careers Next Generation is a fantastic organization. They work with high school students. So if anybody has any kind of questions or concerns about how the apprenticeship programs work, get in touch with Careers Next Generation. They're a great group of people. So, but yeah, I really encourage some more people to get out there and give it a try. And, you know, like me, you know, there's a lot of the things about the trades I didn't know. And now I'm like, holy crap. Holy cow, like I'm so happy that I found this because it was something that I didn't ever thought for myself. But with growing up on an acreage and being outside and I guess playing with the boys, it was it made it a lot easier for me to get into it. So I, I really encourage people to reach out and just even just ask questions. And yeah, I really encourage people to do that. <laughs> Awesome. Great. So at this, this is the point in the interview where we ask our guests to plug um, any of their social or anything else. Like, so if you have public social media account or a blog or YouTube channel or whatever, this would be an opportunity for you to share it. I'm possibly working on maybe getting a YouTube channel together one day, me and a girlfriend of kind of a girlfriend who's a plumber. We're told by careers when we did a virtual camp during COVID there, they said you should make it a YouTube channel and just, you know, go through trade stuff and just simple little things for people to do at home and, you know, maintenance on their equipment and just certain things. So we're working on that. And one day, hopefully, maybe okay. if I find some encouraging or, you know, I'm a little shy sometimes so i haven't really <laughs> been a technology person so social media is not yes yeah, i have a facebook page but it's completely personal and it's just sure. to keep in touch with people if i do get a youtube i will let you know and we yeah. will get it out there <laughs> I'm sure it won't be out in time for when this goes live because it'll probably be the beginning of August. But um, yeah, if you let me know, then I will definitely like add it into the podcast description for future people who are listening. So yeah, totally. Perfect. <laughs>
All right. And then if uh, listeners are interested in following Alberta Worker on social media, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also visit us at albertaworker.ca. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter. We send out daily, weekly, and monthly issues where we do a summary of all our latest news stories. If you like this particular episode, please rate and review, and it'll help to get people aware of our podcast episode, and it will bump us up in the algorithm. If you want to support the Alberta Worker, you can do that at our website as well, albertaworker.ca slash support. The Alberta Worker and this podcast depend on the generous donations of listeners like you. If you're interested in being a guest, just drop us a line, podcast at albertaworker.ca or send us a DM on social media. Thank you very much, Courtney, for joining us today. Thank you for all the listeners for joining in. And as always, solidarity. Thank you.